We are a diverse community of imperfect people who see the church as less of something to go to and more as a life to be lived and shared with others. We are continuing going and what it means to love one another. Fighting for unity rather than fighting over unnecessary arguments. We are living to serve this world in the way of Jesus. Serving those in need and those on the margins. Knowing that friendship truly makes a difference. So if you're coming with questions or curiosities, hurts or frustrations, joys or celebrations, wondering if the church can bring clarity or hope, or simply be a place to belong, we invite you to be at home with us. We invite you to explore with us. We invite you to grow with us. And we invite you to belong with us. Welcome to Southridge. We're glad you're here. Hi everyone, and welcome to Southridge. If this is your first time with us, we want to offer a few tips on how to get the most out of the experience. This time that we spend together requires mindful and intentional engagement. So resist the temptation to sit and watch. Instead, we encourage you to actively participate, just like you would if we were in the same, the same room. Turn up the volume and sing along. Musicians, download the music charts below on the video. Grab your instrument, play along. If English isn't your first language or you have a hearing challenge, we encourage you to turn on the closed caption. Transcripts are available below on the video recorder. We will also be celebrating the Lord's Supper. So please take a moment and make sure that you have something to eat and to drink. Any kind of bread, cracker, cookie to eat, and any kind of drink, juice, tea, coffee, or water. Have it ready for later. If you need a moment to get the supplies, feel free to pause the video now and go and get them. As we begin our worship, I wanna read a passage from the Bible that reminds us how we should think about the kind of community that God intends for us to be. Ephesians 3, 6 says, the mystery is that people who have never heard of God and those who have heard of him all of their lives, what I am now calling outsiders and insiders stand on the same ground before God. They get the same offer, the same help, the same promises in Christ Jesus. The message is accessible and welcoming to everyone across the board. So, whoever you are, wherever and whenever you are, whether you feel like an insider or an outsider, we hope that for the next hour, you will know that you are among friends. Welcome to Southridge. We're glad you're here. Together, there were walls between us. There were walls between us. By the cross, you came and broke them down. You broke them down. There 
Fire the chains around us. Fire your grace, we are no longer bound. No longer bound. You call me. You call me out of the grave. You call me into the light. You call my name and then my heart came alive. Your love is greater. Your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater. Your love is stronger. Shaking, all the dead are coming back to life. Yeah, back to life. Hear the song awaken, all creation singing. We're alive, cause you're alive. You call me out of the grave, you call me into the light. You call my name. Friends, I know we're feeling so scattered right now. It's kind of like we're pulled in a thousand directions. Hard to find our bearings. Hard to know where home is. You know, hard to, to find our anchors and we're, we're battling so much. And I know it's a bit weird, you know, singing from where you are, maybe from home. You know, singing uh, while following me on a screen here. But I wonder for some of us if uh, singing is exactly what our hearts need right now as a way to express kind of our need to find that the hope and the freedom and the home and the anchoring that Jesus offers. So if that's you, I invite you to join your voice in and your heart in as we sing this song together. God of ages, be my anchor. Be my light and be my shield. Be my strength and my confession. Be my song. Be my victory in my battles, in my battles. I'll remember you will keep me in perfect peace you are faithful my defender you are good you will always be you have set me free because you have set me free 
You changed this heart into your home and ever I'll be with you. I'm back where I belong. I will live to see your love invading grace unbroken. Never I'll be with you. I'm back where I belong. Let my life burn. Let my life burn with compassion like a fire that never dies. Build your church. Build your church and build your kingdom here for this cause. I'm giving up my life because you have set me free. You've changed this heart into your home and never I'll be with you. I'm back where I belong. I will live to see. Love invading grace unbroken Never I'll be with you I'm back where I belong This next part, I invite you just to close your eyes for a moment As we hum this tune together May it be a simple expression of your longing to belong To find home, to find freedom To know you are loved in Jesus Broken hearted, broken hearted. Lift your heads up and come to Jesus and come back home. Cause he is greater than the fears you face. You are loved. Come home where you belong. You have set us free. You have set us free. Change the heart into your home. I'll be with you. I'm back where I belong. I will live to see love and vain and grace unbroken. Never I'll be with you. I'm back where I belong. Yes, ever I'll be with you. I'm back where I want more. Please join me and bow our heads in prayer. Dear Father God, I just want to thank you for being you, for being a loving father, a father who is in control, a loving father who is always protecting us. God, I pray that we would feel your presence in our day-to-day -day comings and goings. I don't know if for some people it's been a difficult week or an easy week, but God, it's so easy for us to drift away from you. So Lord, I pray that you would keep us connected to you. And more than that, Lord, I pray that you would keep us connected to one another in our community. Lord, it's difficult with COVID restrictions to do that safely, but I pray that you would give us new, innovative ways to connect, that we would be able to reach out to family and friends in a safe way, that we would still be able to do things in our community that are going to honour you and honour your name. Lord, I just ask for a blessing over each and every one of us and for protection over each and every one of us. And I pray these things in your mighty name, Jesus Christ. Amen. I was walking down on Broadway in a multitude of marchers on parade. There was anger, there was passion, there was mercy, there was peace yet to be made. And the mask that we were wearing kept the virus in control, or so they say. 
And there was sickness in the air, and to be fair, it was the grief And all the grievances that plague the many years And caused the tears on every face There are things I've done that need to be forgiven But I'm still learning how to ask Cause the virus in my veins has been contained by this inherited mask And I'd rather be exposed to what is killing Than to hide from what's to blame Let me lift my voice on Broadway Let me lift my brother's cross Let me mourn for what it cost And feel the magnitude of loss in every name George, Brianna, Amar If you pay any attention to the headlines this week, you know that the George Floyd trial ended with a verdict that, for some, signaled hope for a world where justice will bring peace to those who need to know that their lives really do matter. In the wake of his death and so many other instances of racialized violence, you may have noticed the hashtag say his name and say her name have become a bit of a movement on social media, all in the hopes that saying would lead to seeing. I mean, this series is all about confronting our unintentional but pervasive tendency to not see those on the margins, whether the poor, the disabled, those with different skin colors, those who didn't happen to be born here, those whose love looks different than ours. We stereotype, we depersonalize, or, or unintentionally ignore, and we lose the ability to truly see one another, leaving some among us to feel almost invisible. There's a story in the Bible about a woman named Hagar, a victim of slavery, of sexual violence, of shunning, who found herself languishing on the margins, wondering if her life mattered until God appeared to her and said her name, Hagar. In response, Hagar gave God one of God's most beautiful names, El Roy, the God who sees. It's so just like when we say the names of George, Brianna, Ahmad, when God said Hagar's name, she felt seen that her life mattered. So what if just like God did for Hagar, we could leverage the very simple act of saying someone's name as a way of not just honoring their memory, but of celebrating their existence and centering them in our hearts and in our community. And not just for victims of violence, but for all of those marginalized and dehumanized by our silence, our unwillingness to see. And so in today's practice, we just want to create some space right now to prayerfully say some names as a way of inviting God to help us see the Hagars all around us. You know, not just the distant, highly publicized names like George Floyd, but the very real people living right here among us where we are today. And so what I want you to do is for a moment, just consider the people in your world, those who are likely to be feeling unseen. Now, they might even be those whose names you don't actually know. Now, the guy at work nobody talks to, the, the girl who went at school nobody sits with those who are ignored, avoided, and, and marginalized for all the reasons that we have been talking about around here lately. And then as these faces come to your mind, I want you to try the simplest of prayers with me. Just say their name out loud and let the saying of it be 
a soul level seeing of their humanity and value as beloved children of God. Let's pray. God, who sees every single one of us, would you help us to learn to do better by and for and with each other in this beautiful, wild, and diverse kaleidoscope of humanity that we are a part of together. May we learn how to see each other through your eyes. And in learning and speaking each other's names, May we give each other the gift of being valued and held as the truly and deeply beloved of God. Amen. And there's more, so many more, but there's just no way to say every single name. Till every soul has been remembered Every stony heart is tendered, every all has been surrendered, every noble cause is rendered obsolete. And I believe that there's a reckoning in store, and all the poor and the oppressed will be the first who were the last, and all the lost and all the cursed will be the blessed. So let this kingdom of the least spread the table for the feast and light the flame. Let us send the invitation, every tribe and every nation. There's no corner of creation that is safe from this salvation. It is rolling down the mountain like the water from a fountain. It is breaking on the beaches. From the deep and distant reaches of the seas And all the gleaners are the proclamation bringers And the dancers are the answers To the questions of the singers And we'll shout that we were wrong We had it coming all along But then the mercies of the Lord Will be the chords to every song And all the glories of the King Will be the melodies we sing And all these marchers on parade are making ready for that day so it begins as I repent and bow my head as I lament this broken world cause every victim every villain was a precious little boy or little girl this is me and this is you this is the truth if you believe it or not You have always been beloved They have always been beloved George, Brianna, Amar As Mandy just shared with us, saying aloud the names of victims of violence and oppression, honoring and celebrating George Floyd is an important part of the story. But as Mandy showed us, we can't stop there. 
We want to honor and celebrate the people in our midst right now who may be at risk of experiencing that feeling of being unseen. And you're about to meet some incredible people who are beloved friends and who join us here in Niagara from the Caribbean doing essential work in this neighborhood for the majority of each year. Wayne Walters, Colin Hepburn, Mervyn Smythe, Dennis Walker, Hugh Simpson, Elvis Samuels, Howard Cole, and some of their families as well. Learn their names, say their names, see their lives. They're not invisible, they're reflections of the God we serve. And they're here with our Community Life videos this week. Hello to all my Swedish friends and family on behalf of all my co-workers. Just want to say thank you for being there for us. We truly enjoy the love and care you show to us. We are asking for your prayer and support for us in these times for our country which is going through and volcanic eruption. Please pray for the safety of everyone and for those who lost their homes without water or electricity. I sincerely thank you for all your prayers and God richest blessing. Hello, hello to everyone. All my Canada friends, I'm still in Jamaica. But I'm going to be with you guys like on the 14th of this month. Should be Wednesday coming. And I'm very happy to be back with you guys. Telling you guys how much God spare life and God rich, riches blesses, blessing upon, up, upon us. I lose a brother like a couple of days ago. I won't be in Jamaica for his funeral. But nevertheless, my spirit may be here with them. Even though my... My body may be gonna be in Canada, but my spirit is here with them. Pray for everyone. Always pray for everybody. Like I know enough of you guys do. Wishing you guys God blessing. And I know I'm gonna see you guys soon. Thank you, thank you, love you, love you. Bye bye. Hi guys, this is Elvis saying hi from Jamaica. I'd like to introduce my family to you guys. Hi, I'm Sandrine. I'm Elvis's daughter. Hi, I'm Elvis' wife. Hi, I'm, I'm Elvis's son, EJ. Hi, I'm Grandpa's grandson. My, um, my name is Daryl, and, uh, and I'm seven years old. Hi, from Hi, Hi. 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 Okay, guys. Hi, everyone. As you all know, this is you. I'm here in Jamaica with my beautiful family, my wife Nahelia and my son Nayan, and we are doing okay. I'm just giving shout out to all my Southridge family. Hope you guys are all doing good and hope to see you guys soon. Love you all. Bye. I, I am Karen Cole and I will be introducing my wonderful family today. This is my dad, Howard Cole. This is my mommy, Shereen Cole. This is my baby sis, Sharina Cole. And this is my other sis, Rani Cole. I personally want to say thank you guys for taking care of my dad. He speaks highly of you guys, so um, I just want to say thanks. And I hope that God will um, continue to bless and keep you safe. One love. Southridge Church, all the brothers and sister. This is Mervyn. I love you guys. I won't be coming back to Canada, so I I will be missing you guys, and I still love you. Yet I'm so far away, but I still love you guys, and I will never stop loving you. I have the love of God for all you guys. Special, special, special love of God. Remember, one love, one heart. One arm and with my respect. Hello, good afternoon you all. I'm just here to say greetings to Salt Reach Church family and friends. Thank you so well welcome us back here in Canada to work this year. Thank you very much for working up welcoming us back here. <laughs> Bless them. Friends, you might be able to feel this even right now, but when God calls us outwardly into relationship, especially relationships that we need to go out of our usual rhythms to find, it resonates inwardly with the truest parts of who he created us to be. 
And I'd like to invite you to participate in getting to know friends in our communities of Welland and St. Catharines whose names you don't yet know. And here in our Vineland community with our friends, Wayne, Colin, Mervyn, Dennis, Hugh, Elvis, and Howard, who today represented on behalf of a far larger group that we would love to get you connected with. It's challenging during a season like this and it's never been more important. You can contact me and along with our teams, we'll start this journey together. Now, the friendships we have with our migrant farm worker community and the supports we're able to help offer is just one of the many reasons why your financial giving is also crucial to what it means to be a part of the Southridge Church family. Now, we've been amazed by our community's faithful generosity as good stewards of what God has entrusted to us, especially in these times of economic uncertainty. If you're able to give today, you can do so by clicking the link below. There are options to give by credit card, e-transfer, or to set up a regular automatic withdrawal. And you can also give directly through our new Southridge app. If you're joining us for the first time today, we're so glad you joined us and hope you feel like you're among friends and family. And as our way of saying thanks for joining us, we'd love to send you a no strings attached gift from our Southridge Jam Company, our social enterprise. And just scroll down below this video to, uh, on our online services page, and you'll see a section specifically for newcomers. If you're comfortable with sharing some basic info with us, we'd love to get that gift sent off to you, just as a little expression of gratitude and welcome. Now, today we're continuing our current message series called All Inclusive Faith, a series exploring God's invitation to embrace an all-inclusive diversity in our lives and our church. If you've missed any of the mornings in the series, we highly recommend going back to take in those experiences on our website or on our YouTube channel. They've been really formative for us. And as we continue today, we'll be hearing from our teaching pastor, Mike Krause. Now, wherever you are right now, let's open our hearts to what God has to say to each of us. Here's Mike. When you were growing up, were you ever a part of a clique? Now, I was never one of the kids that was cool enough to be a part of a clique, although with a couple of exceptions, I think I was. When we were younger it, at our denominational summer camp, everyone who was not from Niagara always said that Niagara kids, and in particular Southridge kids, acted in a way that excluded others. They were a clique to themselves. The people felt like we were snooty and arrogant in the way we treated everyone else. Probably the only other time I can really think of being a part of a clique was in my engineering department at the University of Waterloo. And in particular, I mean, we looked down on everybody that was not an engineer at Waterloo, but in particular, we loved to look down on the math department. We had songs and chants and jokes to remind everyone that engineers were better than math majors and engineers from Waterloo were better than engineers from everywhere else. It seems like whether you were a part of a clique or whether you were part of being excluded from a clique, cliques were a disastrous, unfortunate part of the social fabric of all of our lives. There were these groups that formed based on the inclusion of people who shared certain characteristics, whether that's athletics or ethnic background or um, whatever, they were people who looked like each other, talked like each other, thought like each other, act like each other, felt like each other, who shared a sense of the world to the exclusion of everybody else. Sociologically, what cliques do is they offer a sense of stability, security, even safety as pertains to my identity. There are other people like me, so it's okay to be me. They offer a sense of belonging. This is a community where I know I can fit, where I can experience loyalty and commitment if I stay loyal and committed to the group. And every we group that forms, sociologists say, require a they group. Right, A group, as much as it is important to understand who we are, it is equally important, maybe more important, to understand who they are, the people who we aren't. Those are the folks we exclude. 
the ones we ridicule and reject, the ones we mistreat or ignore because they don't look like us, they don't act or think like us, they don't believe or behave like us, they don't feel or see the world in the same way that we do. So we remind them that they are inferior compared to us. Probably the biggest clique I've ever been a part of is this group of people who refer to themselves as Canadians. I mean, oftentimes we we don't know necessarily who we are, maybe, you know, politeness, beer, hockey, cold, but we feel a kinship with each other that's rooted primarily in who we're not. And you all just said it in your heads, we're not Americans. That's how cliques work and what they do. And sadly, they have been rooted in the history of the church from the very beginning. In Mark chapter 9, starting verse 38, it says, Teacher, said John, we saw someone driving out demons in your name and we told him to stop because he was not one of us. Do not stop him, Jesus said, for whoever is not against us is for us. One of Jesus' disciples sees somebody who is acting as though he was one of Jesus' disciples, but he wasn't a part of their little group that had surrounded Jesus. And so John goes out of his way to make this person stop being a poser, stop pretending to be a part of the group. You see, what John was doing was policing the boundaries. We need to keep those inside the circle pure, and therefore we need to keep those outside the circle, outside the circle. We need to know who we are. We need to know who they are so that we can love and accept we and reject and ridicule they. And the church has done this always. Martin Luther King Jr. said that racially the most segregated time of the week is Sunday morning. The churches where people don't look like each other, act like each other, believe like each other, or practice like each other, don't meet with each other. Even in, you know, in our denomination growing up, if you wanted to take communion in a Mennonite brethren church, the only way to qualify to do that is to be a member from another Mennonite brethren church. If you were a Christian who loved and followed Jesus, but you belonged to a different denomination, you were not Part, you are not enough like us to qualify to be in the circle. But we do it individually too, even as Christians. A couple of years ago, we talked about how our friendship network is made up of a group of about five best friends, a group of about 15 close friends, a group of about 50 good friends, and a group of about 150 people we would call friends. My question is, as you think about your five or your 15 or even your 50, how many of those people are there because they look like you, talk like you, think like you, act like you, behave like you, believe like you, feel like you, look at the world the same way? How diverse are the communities of people who form your friendship circles? Because this is what we do. We form groups of people like us to give us a sense of safety and belonging and meaning. And it is fundamentally the opposite of what Jesus says. Jesus says, don't stop him for whoever's not against us is for us. You know who belongs in our group? Every single person who wants to be. Because the love of God is broad. In John 3.16, it says, So God so loved the world that God gave God's only Son, so that everyone who believes in Jesus won't perish but will have eternal life. Who are the, what is the group of people that motivated to God to act savingly towards the world? What is the group of people that motivated God to send God's Son, Jesus, into the world? What was the characteristic they shared in common? It was humanity. God's love reaches out to all without exclusion, condition, or restriction. And God demands that the communities that claim to represent God in the world do the same thing. We looked at Romans 15, 7 earlier where it says, So welcome each other in the same way that Christ has also welcomed you for God's glory. The Apostle Paul says, if you want to glorify God with your life, if you want 
to make the beauty of God's love obvious to the world then welcome everybody else with the same lack of exclusion, condition, or restriction as God has welcomed you. And the word welcome, by the way, doesn't mean, you know, to shake somebody's hand at the door. The word welcome means to pull somebody towards yourself, to embrace them towards you, to, to claim them as your own, to say you belong to us. It's what the Bible calls hospitality. In Hebrews 13, it says, do not forget to show hospitality to strangers. The word hospitality doesn't refer to see, to serving tea and cookies and making polite small talk with people you know and you like. The literal translation of the word hospitality in the Bible is loving strangers like family. Loving the one who's different. Loving the one who's outside the circle. Loving the one who doesn't look like you, talk like you, act like you, think like you, believe like you, behave like you, feel like you, or look at the world the same as you. Loving the one that makes you uncomfortable. Loving the one who causes tension in your soul. Loving the one who sometimes you're tempted to think of as an enemy. Loving that person like your own flesh and blood. What does it look like to love people like that? It means to offer them what we would offer the people who are like us. Safety, security, or safety, belonging, and meaning. Christian writer Brian McLaren has said recently that our brain, broadly speaking, is divided into three areas that form a three-person committee to help us navigate the world. The first person is the amygdala, who's responsible for our basic needs, has this instinct for our needs to be met, including our need for safety. It's the fight, flight, freeze, appease part of our brain that keeps us safe in danger. The second part is the limbic brain, which is sort of the emotion center. And part of what the limbic brain does is it forms relationships and connections with other beings. It's where we sense our belonging. It is the infant's infant, the infant's instinct to feed that comes from the amygdala. It is the infant's desire to look into the eyes of their parent or caregiver while they do that comes from the limbic brain. And the third part of the brain is the neocortex, the reason and logic center where we make meaning of the world. And the whole point of community is for us to come together and to together discover the meaning of this life of following Jesus. But in order to discover meaning, we have to feel like we belong like there's a place for us, like we can make connections, like we fit in, that we, these are our people. But in order to feel like we belong, we have to feel safe, that these people aren't going to hurt me just because I'm different. I would say the Bible challenges us to a life of hospitality that offers safety, belonging, and meaning to everybody, regardless of how similar they are or how different, without exclusion, restriction, or condition. And then Jesus goes further. Luke 14, then Jesus said, when you host a lunch or dinner, don't invite your friends, your siblings, your relatives, or your rich neighbors. Instead, when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the disabled, and blind. Jesus, in the ancient world, when you ate with somebody, it was more than just sharing food. It was a way of saying, you are my people. It was a way of offering equality, dignity, and respect to others. And Jesus says to his disciples, when you gather people around, when you set the table, don't just set the table for people who are already in your circle. Don't set the table just for people whose circle you would like to one day be a part of, your rich neighbors. Instead, Jesus says, when you set the table, set the table in an inclusive way that actually prioritizes people who don't get invited to tables. In this sense, he talks about the disabled and, and blind but he's saying, it's a, he's sort of flipping the table of invitation and saying, when you invite people to your table, be a living manifestation of what Jesus has said somewhere else, where the last people to be invited are the ones who are invited first. 
Set the kind of table where the last people to be picked on the playground are the ones you pick first. He's not just talking about how we share food. He's talking about intentionally and deliberately offering safety, belonging, and meaning to people who aren't usually included in our communities for those things because they're too different than us. There's lots of ways to do it. I just want for, as we close, I just want to think about one really simple but powerful way that we offer safety, belonging, and meaning. And that's in the way that we use language. If you've been listening, you've noticed in this sermon that instead of reading the words cripple and lame, I read the word disabled. Why did I change the Bible like that? (laughs) Turns out the words cripple and lame are offensive and even insulting to most people who have disabilities in the way that they walk. So I choose not to be offensive and insulting. You've noticed that instead of reading the words brothers and sisters, I read the word siblings. Because even in our community, there are people whose understanding of their gender doesn't fall neatly into clean-cut categories of male and female. There are intersex people and transgender people and people whose gender understanding is more fluid than that. And maybe that's not how you understand gender, but that's actually not important because we're not talking about your gender. And equality, dignity, and respect says, I'm going to treat you in the way that you would like to be treated, in a way that honors you. You'll have noticed that I didn't, when talking about God, use the language of he and his. I said God and God's. Because I think sometimes when we ascribe masculinity to God, we run the risk of communicating that men are somehow more in the image of God than other people. And I wouldn't want to exclude anybody from their understanding of being in the image of God. I remember years ago, there was a novel called The Shack in which the Trinity was depicted as a black woman, a male Middle Eastern man, and a, an Asian woman. And everyone was all up in arms. But, but why not? If everyone is equally reflective of the image of God, if the image of God includes everyone in the raw material of their humanity, in their, in their skin and gender and other ways, then why not speak about God in ways that can include everybody? But those are the kinds of acts of hospitality that you can only learn when you're sitting at the table with people who are different than you. When you're committed to listening instead of speaking, instead of asking questions instead of giving opinions, getting into relationships of equality and dignity and respect and learning what it takes from them to offer hospitality to everyone. So here's the question. Who's invited to your table? And how can you and I become the kind of people who invite everyone, but especially extending invitations to those who get invited last, first? Within the church, one of the communities that has consistently been invited last is the LGBTQ plus community. So like every week in the series, We want to give some time for you to hear from Sylvia about her journey of faith as an LGBTQ plus woman. Well, hey, Sylvia, thank you so much for doing this interview with us. Uh, It's great to see you face to face, uh, even if it's just over Zoom. Uh, For those in our community who don't know you, uh, could you just take a moment and introduce yourself to us? Yeah, for sure. My name is Sylvia Zavitz, and uh, I was born and raised in Beamsville. Met my wife in 2016, Jody, and uh, we got married actually three months uh, from the day that we met. Um, And we've been married for coming up to five years now. Yeah, so church was a huge part uh, of my life. I, I really I, I can't take church away at all. It was, 
it was uh, my friends, it was my activities, it was everything about uh, who I grew up to be. I mean, you talked, when we spoke the other day, you told me that it was a little bit later in your life when you discovered that you were gay. Um, when you discovered that you were gay, how did you process that uh, in relation to your faith or your experience of faith growing up? That was a huge challenge because uh, being gay is not really an option in, uh, in uh, a really strict, traditional, evangelical Christian faith. And so the first part of my transformation was God speaking to me very directly saying, Sylvia, I created you exactly the way you are. You are exactly who is going to do work for me. I love you. You're worthy. You are enough. You don't need to be anything other than who you are and what you are. Uh, talk about how, when you came out publicly as gay, how did the church treat you? How did, how did that affect your relationships with other Christians? To be completely honest, there were a lot of church members who absolutely embraced me right from the very beginning, but there were a lot of church members who did the exact opposite. I try to be really, really respectful of those people still. I'm wanting them to accept my choices and respect me. And, and I kind of have to do the same for them. I, I have to respect their choices. Fast forward to uh, finding Southridge. I had uh, gotten to know quite a few people uh, by way of going to an Italian restaurant in St. Catharines, um, where there was live music every Wednesday night. I'd gotten to know a, a whole bunch of people who went to Southridge. So I went to Southridge on a Sunday morning and they played this video. Big or small here? There's room for us all here. Doubt or believe here? We can all receive here. Gay or straight here? There's no hate here. With this whole message about whichever one of those people you are, you're welcome here. Mm -hmm. And we invite you to encounter Jesus with us, which was so huge for me because that was the most painful part of everything I had been through with my family and with my church family because that's what they were saying to me you're no longer welcome tell me with kind of raw honesty don't don't pull any punches for you and for Jody talk about sort of the the negative aspects still even of being part of a church like Southridge like do you do you want me to be fully and completely honest here that's the hope. For me, it's enough to know that I'm absolutely welcome in your midst. But for some, the fact that you wouldn't be allowed to actually perform a same-sex marriage, that speaks volumes. Because if you're not able to perform a same-sex marriage, that says something about your fundamental definition of what marriage is. And, and if that is still the traditional marriage is one man and one woman for life, then that is always going to be a message to those of us who don't fit into that definition of marriage. For sure, um, that still communicates something less than full acceptance and full inclusion. People, people are allowed to have differences of opinion um, and people are allowed to think their own thoughts. 
but be respectful in the process and, and not draw lines of exclusion as a result of those differences of opinion. The church should be the place where we feel the most welcome. That, I think at a really fundamental level, that's what Jesus was all about. That Church is where you're welcome. You're, you're, you could have issues in all sorts of other places, but come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. What does that mean? If not, that this is my design for church for the community, for the family of church, that you feel like you are a part of this and you belong. I don't, I don't pretend to think that 100% of the members at Southridge uh, all believe that gay marriage is fine because I'm sure some of them have issues with it too. I, th I think for a lot of my LGBTQ plus friends, the church is the last place where they feel welcome. The church is where we should feel rest and acceptance. But that's, that's what Jesus says. That's what Jesus wants for his people and for his church. And so it causes me great pain every time I, I know someone else who's really kind of turned their back on church because they have felt so much judgment and so much uh, resistance to who they are. I mean, for, for people, part of the lgbtq plus community um the church has often put them last but jesus said that in in god's kingdom the last become first what are some practical ways here and now that at southridge we could be a last becoming first kind of a church for lgbtq plus people Providing a place where we feel welcome is, is all it takes to heal um, the hurt that was done. Rather than feeling really, really strong in your conviction, whatever side it puts you on, Find somebody and befriend them. As soon as you get to know them and understand what their struggles have been and what life has been like for them, that helps you gain insight into what, what their life has been like. And it makes you a lot less likely to be judgmental you have been incredibly gracious incredibly kind uh even just really so encouraging and i really want to thank you for sharing this with our church sharing with me personally and helping me get better thank you tom on a morning where we were inviting people of privilege people who look like me to become people of radical hospitality, welcoming everyone to the table. We thought it was only fitting to end the service by inviting everyone to the table, to the Lord's table, for the Lord's supper, to take communion as a community, in unity, as the diverse church that God is creating us to be. Because that is 
actually part of the core of what communion is meant to represent. In 2 Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the Apostle Paul writes this, I've been told many times that when you meet as a congregation, divisions and cliques emerge. And to some extent, that doesn't surprise me. When all of you gather as one church family, you are not pro really properly celebrating the Lord's Supper. So let each individual first evaluate his own attitude and then only then eat the bread and drink the cup. Paul's point is that when we gather around the Lord's table, whether physically or virtually, we can only celebrate the Lord's Supper to the degree that we are committed to demolishing division, destroying cliques, and welcoming outsiders as insiders in the community. So Paul says, examine yourself, examine your heart, and see whether or not you are living this life of radical hospitality, because anything less at the Lord's table isn't celebrating communion. It's just eating bread and juice. And I know that for some of you, you have waited a long time to feel welcomed in a radically inclusive kind of way in the church, even in this church. You've done what you've could to try and fit in. You've buried your truth along the way. You've tried to cover up um, the places where you feel the risk of being excluded. You've had to pretend that the actions and the comments don't come deep. But this morning, I want to invite you to the table because that is not who God is. That is not what Jesus is about, and that is not what the Holy Spirit is making us to be. And so I invite you to come to the table with us as a community that wants to love you like family, even when we do it badly and even when we get it wrong. And I want you to come to the table to hear God whisper to you, you are welcome just as you are. We're going to watch a video now. And then after the video, the band is going to lead us in a song called Come to the Table. And as that song plays, if you want to be someone that Jesus is forming into a person of radical hospitality where outsiders become insiders, if you want that for our church by the power of the Holy Spirit, or if you just want to be a part of a community that will welcome you that way, then at some point during the song, when you feel prompted, take the bread, which reminds us of Jesus' human life of radical hospitality, and eat it. And then take the juice or the wine, which reminds us of Jesus' death and resurrection, by which we become people of radical hospitality by faith through grace and drink it. We want to invite everybody to come to the table together this morning. Feels like I've spent my whole life trying to be someone else in this world of expectations where value lies in what others want you to be. I've become everything this world demands of me and so I've buried my truth and I've hidden my soul away. I've hidden my deepest urges Stilled the dancing in my feet Hushed the music that swells through my spirit Ignored the dreams that cry to be free I've locked up my struggles for fear of upset Cast off my honesty in case I offend Covered up my questions with fervent prayers Filled the silence with resounding songs Denied my pain, stopped my tears, 
silenced my screams in a world that deems them indecent. I've patched up my brokenness with busyness, gagged my fears with postures of faith, while in reality my head is swimming with doubts and I hide, I hide, pretending to be someone who's got it all figured out. But when the doors are closed and the pressures flee, there is one who comes to me, calling to those places I've buried and erased, where my longings lie tethered in shame, and the voice that's forgotten how to speak, and my shattered self-belief, and my thirsting soul crying to be free, and it is here that love breathes on the embers of a fading flame, drawing the mask from my face, speaking my true name, and calling to my soul to rise again. Because love doesn't cover up weakness, but embraces those that life has beaten. Love lets tears flow freely. Love laments richly the pain of living. Love speaks out fears with no fear of opinion. Love accepts that sometimes love is forsaken. Love wears the wounds as signs of greatness. Love holds the wrongs. Love sings its truest song. Love dances like a child. Love dreams fiercely, wildly, with no need to impress. For love knows its magnificence and shows it to the world. Love holds me, speaks to me, and this is what love says. I want you as you are, child of grace. Come out from the shadows and show me your face. Look into my gaze and see yourself revealed. My perfection. to the 
final song together uh, to the God who knows no outsiders. You are a refuge. You have no borders. When I was a stranger knocking at your door, you took me in with no questions and no conditions. When I was a sin, running from your grace, you called me friend. You called me friend. Cause there are no outsiders to your love. We are all welcome, there's grace enough. When I have No outsiders, no, I'm not an outsider to your love. You are the harbor, you are the harbor in every tempest. When my soul was shipwrecked, tossed upon the waves, you calm the storm. While the Father, there are no orphans. Every tribe and nation gathered in your arms sings with one voice. We sing with one voice. Cause there are no outsiders to your Thanks for joining us today. We hope that you feel inspired and challenged. 
And as we continue to grow into the church that is accessible and welcoming and inclusive of everyone, we hope that you'll start to embrace God's all-inclusive heart for your life as well. In order for what we have heard today to become real in our lives, it's going to take more than this one hour a week that we spend together. It will require a moment-by-moment -moment commitment to practicing the way of Jesus. And that's why we provide lots of ways to lean into God's presence while we're away from one another. You can click on the Practice This Week button below the player, and the spiritual exercises will continue to develop the muscles that we started to build today. You can also get to the spiritual practices notification on our app to get these daily reminders. And as always, we're going to put some questions on the screen. If you're watching with others, they can be a great conversation starter, but they can also be a good way to process what you've heard yourself. Finally, if you'd like a more personal conversation about anything going on in your life, please reach out to our location pastors who would love to connect with you. Simply go to southridgechurch.ca slash contact. Well, that's all for now. Have a great week.